I'm very happy that you're all here for Sven Hilvik. He uh, works uh, at Brot für die Welt and is uh, for commerce, world commerce and environment politics. That's is what he does. And you may know him as part of Brot für die, uh, Brot für die Welt uh, for Bits and Bäume. So I'm very happy that he's at a congress and talks about Justice 4.0. And uh, justice especially in the digitalization uh, in the global south. Thanks, Sven, for being here. Well, thanks uh, for the invitation to the KS Computer Club for this uh, talk. So, as I said, I work at uh, Brut für die Welt uh, for environmental policies. And before I start with the talk, I want to do some introduction why we at Brut für die Welt actually uh, talk about digitalization. Uh, Brot für die Welt, so it's bread for the world, which was uh, founded 60 years ago. It's in 100, active in 100 countries and we have 1,300 partner organizations. And our m the mo most thing we do is like uh, to enhance living conditions for people in uh, poor countries. And so we want to overcome injustice and inequality, especially in health, education, rural uh, development. And we also think of other t topics like economic uh, topics, climate change, resources and uh, trade. And trade and resources very much uh, affect people in, uh, in the global south like indigenous people or farmers in smaller countries or people in the Amazon. And also digitalization also uh, is very, it it's, has a huge effect to the working conditions of people. Uh, we see for example that some partner organizations use uh, digitalization in their during their uh, work so for example in Congo they use drones for drug to to transport drugs into some uh, areas and others say that they are more and more surveilled by technological instruments or devices and so we have multiple comment uh, colleagues who said well we should uh, also think about the risks and also the chances that we have uh, using this digitalization um, I uh, especially look at this from a, from a trade and economic point of view. For two years I did this very intensively and this the, the Justice 4.0 was our publication to this topic which was released some month ago and I want to present this, uh, well, publication. So what are the risks and chances of digitalization for people in the global south? Um, there are many actors uh, who are, see this very optimistically in the in, uh, in this sector and that there's a lot of potential and that uh, poverty and inequality can be overcome by these technologies. I just want to can as uh, quote one of our ministers um, who is responsible for this in Germany that new technologies uh, increase the speed of our life make it more transparent and more efficient more people can uh, ch uh, can share more knowledge and um, yeah you get more people will um, create new companies in small garages and so that's important so what what do we so this what this means uh, there's one thesis which says they will to build totally new markets with which uh, will grow rapidly um, and so that will lead to the increase of um, money for people and also people think that uh, the global, the global trade will be more efficient, more productive, more transparent um, and uh, have an increased value chain uh, at the beginning. So this is what people believe. Um, and what I want to do in my talk is to, to look at these two topics and see what has been actually real, what has been actually realized. And it, how and how they will be done, if they will realize in the future and then uh, talk about some some things w how these potentials can be used more efficiently and more broadly and that and reducing the risks as well 
So I want to start with the world trade, in, because this is because we have uh, data and empirical data, and uh, digitalization is uh, there's a lot of speculation how the future will do, and there is you have a very broad spectrum between dystopia and utopia, and but in the world trade we have uh, just data. So we start with digital goods, so which is which are all goods which are digitally produced, traded, and consumed. So, for example, an ebook or music, video streaming, software, all these kinds of things. And that's the question. So, how this uh, this, this developed within the last 20 uh, years, which uh, governments and world regions uh, profit from it? And there's a uh, report from the UN about that, and we see that 51 percent of the trade with digital digital uh, goods um, are part of Asiatic Pacific. Uh, region, which is China. Then we have North America and Europe. Is, uh, each of them has roughly one fourth. For Africa, uh, together with the Near East, it's just one percent. And for uh, South America, Latin America, we just have one percent. So if you're looking about Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, these are huge countries. Um, so you see, there's a huge inequality. Um, e so the inequality with digital goods is even worse than with other goods, because in those goods, uh, Latin America and Africa at least have 8% together and not just two, which is still too few. The World Trade Organization uh, started at least in parts to liberalize uh, digital trade. Even in, in 1998, they started, uh, uh, well, they made the first uh, th they made the first documents about that, which talked about uh, uh, digital goods, which were liberalized. So there have to no customs. So they they define that they have. It's not allowed to have customs on digital goods. So how this is? What are the effects of this decision of the World Trade Organization? Um, yeah. um, so well, so the responsibilities are f at at for uh, one side for the states and on the other hand for consumers and uh, concerns uh, companies. So for companies, it's good because if you have no customs, because um, th their profits increase and they don't have to pay customs. We as consumers are also happy because if I just uh, want to buy a laptop, I don't have to pay customs for that. Uh, so. The, well, added value that will be by customs. So, yeah. Okay, but um, if we see for the Southern African part, we see that there's they have a negative uh, trade. Uh, well, so they they import more stuff than they export, so they just get a deficit for trade in general. So Malawi, for example, is almost almost. 80 million US dollars. I, I see almost 70, but well. And also countries like uh, countries with a higher industrial grade, like Mexico or Thailand, South Africa, they also have uh, a negative uh, trade balance. Balance. So, so you see, they have like around 200 million US dollars. So all of them really have uh, a deficit here, a negative value. But in 1998, uh, this moratorium is, uh, this moratorium should be uh, time based. So it was all for all two, every two years, this is prolonged. The industrial countries, of course, uh, want to change this into a permanent mo moratorium. And many uh, developing countries are against this, not just because of the negative numbers, but other, but they have two other arguments against putting this into a, a permanent moratorium. Because especially uh, poor development countries rely heavily on customs for their state budget, like Malawi. So their custom is like 40% of the whole income of the state. So if you don't have those customs, you can imagine what that means for investing into health or education. And the second argument is, that customs um, can uh, in can start economic and political um, restrictions and like uh, yeah so they can lead the market so 30 40 years ago like s countries like singapore wanted to um, to protect their local um, industries b uh, b against uh, international um, 
competitors. So they want they, they so they protect them. Um, and this is this is not possible if there are no customs against international competitors. So digital trade changed a lot within the last 25 years. So you get a lot of new products, new uh, ways of, of doing stuff. So we can't actually imagine a life without digital values and and like on hotel online reservations, Amazon, etc. Um, no digital services. Uh, we can't imagine that. So you see that this is an overview. You see there are data, material goods. It's it's a lot of this is data. The OECD said that data is a tradable good. And looking at this dynamic, uh, it's not very surprising that you have a lot of uh, trading. Uh, contracts where you have e-commerce chapters in there which uh, very specifically uh, manage these how data can be transferred and stuff like that that is not a, a coincidence which the the it industry and the some ministries want to make us believe but if we want to understand what happens here and which is a big problem between the industrial states and developing countries, we have to step back uh, a huge way, 20 years actually, um, in this, and look at the Silicon Valley in the 90s and see the tech, cons tech companies uh, like tech companies plan in the long term and strategically like oil companies. So they don't plan for five or ten years, but they, they plan for decades ahead. Look at Facebook. Second In the second half of the 90s, they were just starting up. <laughs> um, and then in the 21st sec uh, century, it was clear that they will, they will get bigger because they knew that it was... Uh, and that no one will be able to stop them to become the new world leaders. So you see here some numbers, yeah. So today, the big five of the Silicon Valley um, have the. Th so they they are much more worth on on uh, the stock markets than uh, oil companies. But they were intelligent, so they knew that this will happen, um, and they will get this dominant role. But they didn't say it because they knew that there will there will be re people will demand regulation for them and stuff like that. And of course, they wanted to to stop that. And so already in the 90s. They thought about how can we, what can we do that there won't be regulations in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And they had a very good idea f from their perspective. They thought about they will have the internet, they will use international trade uh, law to instrument, to use it for their purposes because uh, the WTO um, has just one goal and that is uh, liberalization and deregularization. And this is what. Uh, trade contracts are about. So they want to remove uh, problems for trade and they want to stop them even from popping up. And they were very successful in this, uh, in doing this. So in 2000, the US had a digital ad agenda, which had a ho the whole wish list of the digital, uh, of the Silicon Valley was in there, like there's an anti, uh, anti restriction, so res no, no customs, no open source, no local uh, data pr data storage uh, stuff because everything can be in, in Silicon Valley. So all of this should be added to trade contracts. In 2002 already the US uh, implemented the first uh, uh, digital trade contract and with each of these contracts they they got more and more of those uh, ideas into the, the contracts. Since January 2019, actually, I don't know if you realize that, uh, there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership with uh, with uh, 11 countries in there, like Australia, Brunei, Chile, Japan, you can read the list. Um, and those countries had like, okay, there's a prohibition to store data locally and um, and uh, work on them the, uh, uh, to no have no uh, open source and no have no customs. So and this is now international trade rights. So there's th this is permanent. There's no so expire. There's no expiration for that. 
so maybe you will one you may say well but the US is not in those countries so they they're not part of it yeah uh, but Obama and the US were part of this uh, contract and they made the negotiations for that it was he, it was Obama's big project in the uh, well in the trade project worldwide as the negotiations ended Trump uh, started Trump wasn't interested uh, to to ratify a trade contract that was done by Obama so that's why Trump just went out of it it didn't stop Trump however in October two months ago to have an, uh, his own uh, negotiations with uh, Japan and which conclude which includes all this stuff that's in there Oh, and the coming year will have will will be interesting with regards to digital trade because there will be a mutual agreement um, between uh, yes. Yeah, so there are the friends of e-commerce. These are some countries like the EU, Japan, and China and the USA. They want um, they announced that. They want in 2020 um, to get a mandate that include uh, regulations like the ones I described before. We don't know what will be the consequences of this. And it's clear that, sorry, uh, that, that Angela Merkel and her uh, government is behind these agreements. And even though she said that the EU should not follow the model of the US or China, it should go its own way. And, and I'm coming to the second uh, promise, the digitalization of transport chains should be improved. And this should add the value to the supply chains. A British citizen has looked into the digitalization of developing countries and he has looked into tea pluckers in Africa and he found out that that the tea pluckers wanted to use the internet because it would bring advantages and he found out that digitalization leads to more communication between actors and it leads to more efficient work and digitalization increases transparency of the work. This leads to better management and that the delivery chain can be controlled better. And this is an ex really important aspect. But do the tea pluckers actually earn more money now? And then the investigation found out that there are more consequences for of digitalization. So consumers today, because of transparency, they see where the tea comes from and under which conditions it was produced. So what working conditions, environmental conditions, and that's important to consumers. And, and now companies invest more money into the generation of this data. And this leads to having more delivery chains and also more sources. So you have like 30 pro producers of the tea and that means more competition for the tea uh, producers and therefore they earn less money than before digitalization. So the first part, the first promise came true, the second promise did not become true. And so the adding, the adding of the values is reduced and the people who produce 
the value, the products actually earn less money. The Wertschöpfung, the T-Kette is auch the production of tea um, we see that data are becoming more important and people who have control of the data have power and the question is of course who actually has the data in the data that is obtained in one supply chain is also in of interest in other processes. So the economist said that uh, data is a new oil of the 21st century. And I mean, of course, we can't really just say it's like resources, uh, so like natural resources. It's only a metaphor. And and the extraction of natural resources and the extraction of data, there are structural dependencies, there are so still somewhat similar, but we know that it's not the countries that extract the data, uh, but it's actually the companies who extract the resources. So they they uh, they create the pipelines, they create the and run the ships, and but on the other hand, the internet is a global infrastructure shared by many um, organizations. Okay, how much ma time do I have left? Okay, I come to the conclusion. So the digital trade has the separate has. Uh, increased the uh, the split between the industrial nations and the developing countries. The liberalization of the digital trade in the context of trade agreements um, has improved the conditions of the less competitive industries in the uh, poorest countries of the South. And the digitalization of the global supply chains has increased the efficiency of the production and the transparency, but the adding of the value increases in the north, but not in the south. And if the developing countries, um, sorry, um, next. Uh, and if they keep their sovereignty over their data, they may be able to reverse this trend. And w it would be better if the countries in the global south are en empowered to have their own digital uh, markets and, and therefore the the um, the, the space of options should not be further restricted for countries and economies of the global south. And if you have two actors and you treat them the same, um, then and the second point is that it should be possible to create, uh, to, to protect their own digital industries. This is something that only that is only possible under very restrictive conditions. The second point is we have to remove the digital separation between the global south and the global north. And it's and it's not only about access to the internet, but um, it's but it's not only about the infrastructure, um, but the the companies who create this infrastructure come from the global north, and then um, they don't do it just for um, for charity. They just do it because they have an interest, an economic interest, and this happens because the South ha needs support, so both financial and uh, expertise support. 
from the global north. And the problem is that the monopolies are so massively dominant and it's extremely difficult for new companies to get established in the market. And this applies to the African but also the Indian continent. We have here in Europe a discussion that these monopolies must be regulated. And, well, at least the discussion is going on. It can't be that the, 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 the regulations end at the, Medi at the, Med at the Medi Mediterranean Sea and the big digital companies have to be uh, regulated on the global scale. And many developing countries need to construct and establish um, regional platforms or national platforms and they have and it's difficult for them to be competitive and they need they need free trade zones for this Africa has made the first step so there is an African free trade zone for the EU this means that the EU must inter interact with that zone and, but the thing is that uh, the EU does not only do digital um, agreements but more general agreements yeah, Okay, so also you need like trade union platforms and have new government structures. Um, the big uh, difficulty in this is to have uh, trade union like platforms, um, which has to be well uh, competitive on a global uh, scale. Well, that that may uh, you may have to just uh, uh, thi think out a totally new concept, but you need uh, countries uh, really giving money to that. Also, thank you for your for being here. Thank you very much for the talk. Okay, we have exactly 10 minutes for questions or our comments or our discussion. I already see that the signal angel has a question. So in the meantime, you can go to the microphones. What about SSI? So what about direct marketing? Could that solve some of the problems? Uh, could you please explain what SSI is? Um, I have... Okay, so the internet hasn't responded yet. So maybe it's about direct marketing. You said something about its self-sovereign identity. It's that's the concept, but there's no explanation. Okay, so next question. What do you think of the Russian approach that they created for an, a national alternative for all electronic products? So there was a lot of criticism to this, but what's your opinion on this? Well, um, <coughs> so I think that's a very good but a very difficult question. Uh, I was short, I shortly talked about national data sovereignty. Um, there are two views on that from the human rights perspective, like uh, reporters without borders. Uh, this can be very problematic uh, because authoritarian regimes use this local data storage to control their citizens, of course. So that's the one thing. On the other hand, from an economic perspective, uh, we're this this problem must not lead us to prohibit local data storage because in that case, uh, the digital market will develop the same, will just 
continue how it is done today, so it will be just very unjust. Uh, about the Russian uh, attempt approach, the Russian approach, uh, well, looking at the current uh, uh, government there and uh, what they do to civil organizations, I would say, well, I would rather put it into this uh, uh, problem, problem approach and that's its authoritative and uh, not good. So that's, I think, is the the, the, the the important point, the deciding point in that case. What's the use for this data, local data storage? In the 80s or end of the 80s, I was in Brazil for the Open Source Foundation and Brazil had to pay a lot of money for IT, for IT customs because there were no PC producers and at some point we had to give up because all other parts of the economy in Brazil were suffering that they had such a bad access to IT and if, if you try to protect the digital uh, uh, economy through customs then this might be yeah, this might have negative consequences so you said that the local digital economy has to be pr protected uh, protected with customs but how can you solve this problem well, it really depends on the case. Uh, you're talking most likely about 1998 and backwards. Uh, that case, uh, we had laptops. You had laptops that cost five times as much or the no nine times as much. So, of course, um, it's it's an ambivalent thing. So, if you just have like protection customs without uh, well uh, improving the local uh, companies, but you can do it the other way around. Um, uh, yeah, they talked about Brazilian status of that. And, well, yeah, now he's talking about politics in Brazil, after that, the new presidents, and etc., etc. Um, and then they started investing into into uh, local companies. And this is the same thing that uh, Asian countries did. So, if you if you have just have protective uh, customs uh, which uh, prohibit your uh, to 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 support your local companies, but they can't export anything, that's useless. So you have to think about that. And what I think about Brazil, in special, uh, uh, well, I used fi I worked five years in for a, a human uh, rights organization for Brazil. So now they actually have a deindustrialization. Now the last, last 18 years they really tried to export a lot of stuff, and so they uh, and, and but export actually decreased. So that's like a really bad uh, decision and way. Maybe as an addition. So I'm working for a grassroots movement. So there are some people in Kenya because they can't import 3D printers, they use uh, waste to create their own uh, printers. And so s some things are really hard to get or hard to obtain. Uh, we also have some more questions from the Signal Angel and from people in the room. But first of all, I will ask the Signal Angel and the other people can talk to you directly afterwards. What, what, what does it actually mean to not be allowed to store local data? Well, that's about all data. So, prohibition of local data storage, there are different variants. Uh, well, the most far-fetched or far-reaching thing is that uh, in a multilateral multi uh, tr trade agreement, all data that is that have that have any uh, that are in any way related to a contract uh, that so had somehow to do with tr with the commerce they are not allowed to be uh, processed or stored in local data storage they have to be in a well with part of a, of a yeah of a business contract, but it's very far-reaching, actually. Again, uh, again. Maybe one short comment on your website, Brot for the Welt. 
There is a blog entry on in German. Um, so and also there's a document, corresponding document, document in English, and then you can read more about this. And yeah, just one more question from Microphone One. Thank you for the vortrag. I have a very short question, and it was: "Schlägt Trump ja relativ viel Porzellan auch bei der WTO?" Trump really likes to destroy a lot of porcelain at the WTO. Das denn vielleicht dazu, dass sich da was ändert, weil ja keine Schiedsverfahren mehr entschieden werden können. Maybe this will actually change something because the referee procedures are no longer a thing. Well, uh, the current developments in the WTO are very controversial. One week after the US totally um, blocked all new developments there, and then uh, one week afterwards, Trump went to this uh, to this uh, jury. Um, and in 2019, they have a bilateral um, agreements with some countries, very important countries, and they want, starting in 2020, uh, to have a plurilateral um, declaration or agreement. So you have 60, 65 countries, and they want to agree that we will have ad hoc juries, which before that the WTO had, and so, but they want like, and they want to become a permanent uh, jury like the WTO was first. That is very problematic from a world trade perspective because that is what the industrial countries do, and so of course they don't care for the local for the global south. Um, and then you say, um, if a German saying, if you're not sitting at the table to eat you will be eaten okay microphone two with regard to brazil and e-waste but how how does this relate to justice also with regard to right to repair and right to modify so it's not all, all about just production, but also about uh, repairing things. That is, of course, an important remark. Um, we have been uh, with uh, Bits and Bäume also, we've been part of Bits and Trees, uh, with uh, where we have like economic uh, stuff. And so I just looked into one small part, because the topic is uh, the, the macroeconomic uh, results and, and, and uh, outcomes of this. Um, but of course, uh, I agree with you that uh, repair is important. Okay, I see there is uh, enough potential for a greater discussion, maybe something for next Congress. Uh, one suggestion, if you are interested, there is an art documentary which is called uh, Made in Africa, which is about hacker spaces and um, lab labs in Africa. So and I'm looking forward to talk to you outside of the lecture hall. And of course, you can meet us at the Bits and Bäume area if you have time today. Thank you very much. Just a very short remark. It was a